I ask the Senate to consider and to promptly confirm the nomination of Judge Stephen Breyer as the 108th Justice of the Supreme Court. Judge Breyer has devoted his entire life to public service. As a law clerk to Justice Arthur Goldberg, as a young lawyer at the Justice Department, as a teacher opening young minds to the promise and discipline of the law, as a member of the Watergate Special Prosecutor's Office, as chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, and for 14 years as an exceptional judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. That was President Clinton's announcement that he was appointing Judge Stephen Breyer to the Supreme Court back in 1994. Well, now official word today that Justice Stephen Breyer will retire from the high court. Now, this afternoon, Justice Breyer announced his plans to step down at the end of the current term. The announcement opens the door for President Joe Biden to fulfill a promise he made on the campaign trail to fill that opening on the Supreme Court with the first black female justice. I committed that if I'm elected president, have an opportunity to appoint someone to the courts, will be a, I'll appoint the first black woman to the courts. It's required that they have representation now. It's long overdue. And that commitment was reiterated yesterday from Biden's press secretary, Jen Tatsky. The president has uh, stated and reiterated his commitment to nominating a black woman to the Supreme Court and certainly uh, stands by that. Justice Breyer is just one of three remaining liberal justices on the high court, and his decision to retire after more than 27 years allows Biden to appoint a successor who could serve for decades. Now, closing arguments anchor Vinnie Politan takes a look back at Justice Breyer's career. Associate Justice Stephen Breyer was nominated to the high court in May 1994 by President Bill Clinton. I asked the Senate to consider and to promptly confirm the nomination of Judge Stephen Breyer as the 108th Justice of the Supreme Court. Breyer was confirmed by a vote of 87 to 9. Born and raised in San Francisco, he always knew he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and become a lawyer. It was a time when you sort of tended to do what your parents said. <laughs> This is completely foreign to this entire audience. Such an idea. But he was a lawyer. Breyer attended Stanford and Oxford universities before graduating magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. Judge Breyer has devoted his entire life to public service. As a law clerk to Justice Arthur Goldberg, as a young lawyer at the Justice Department, as a teacher opening young minds to the promise and discipline of the law, as a member of the Watergate Special Prosecutor's Office, as chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, and for 14 years as an exceptional judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. As far as becoming a judge is concerned, for any lawyer, a federal judge, lightning has to strike. I mean, it really does. And uh, uh, to be on the Supreme Court, it has to strike twice in the same place. Breyer is part of the Supreme Court's liberal wing and is known for being the most pragmatic of the justices, focused on building consensus. He has enormous respect for the ability of Congress to figure things out and to legislate. And he was more a part of the congressional branch of government before he became a judge and then a justice. Breyer also has enormous respect for the other eight justices and the institution of the Supreme Court. Never heard a voice raised in anger in that conference room in, on the court. Never. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard one judge say anything derogatory in that room about another. And uh, not even as a joke. It's professional. You state your views. You listen to what the other person said. And then you try to work with that. And you see business is business. And personal relations are different. With more than 20 years on the bench, Stephen Breyer is philosophical about his job as a Supreme Court justice. Our job is not to say what is good or bad for the country. That's primarily the job of the ballot box. Our job is to decide whether what the country comes up with through the legislative or the administrative processes may be different in different states, whether that is consistent with this document. And this document does not tell people how to live. It tells them how they're going to govern themselves. 
All right. I would like to welcome my special guest, constitutional lawyer and civil life litigator, Andrew Lieb. Andrew, thanks for coming back on the show. Truly appreciate it. You know, this guy, he's a giant. Uh, I've admired him a long time. As a matter of fact, his latest book is on my night table and has been there. I, I read it regularly. Um, your thoughts on, on his legacy? What a legacy, Michael. And mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me on to talk about Justice Breyer. 28 years, and he's still going strong. These recent arguments that happened with OSHA, he was very adamant in. The recent arguments when it came to going with abortion rights, very adamant in. He's making his voice heard all to the end. But I think the reason that he's actually resigning now is we know that we have November 8th coming up. And as we learn from the Republicans, when they were in charge with a different office having president, they refused to give advice and consent and created a new rule for passing, for passing who is going to be the new justice. So they narrowed the window. And unfortunately, I think, because I very much enjoyed his questioning and what he says, Justice Breyer is retiring to give President Biden a chance to nominate a liberal in his place. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And that was going to be my next question. You know, there, there at least seemed to have been a lot of pressure on him to leave at this point, but he still seems pretty much in his prime. As I said, his latest book was released a little while ago, just at the end of last year. Uh, you know, just, just the same funny, pragmatic guy he's always been. Uh, we know their lifetime appointments. He can leave when he wants to, but he is bowing to pressure. How do you, how do you put that in perspective? I put it into perspective in that he understands his role and he understands the importance of the court. We often forget that there's co-equal branches of government. And when I talk to people that aren't on court TV and not watching courts regularly, they forget that the court is a co-equal branch of government. And I think Justice Breyer, among most of his other admirable characteristics, is a principled man. And when you listen to his arguments and what he says about different cases, he's interested in principle. And I think what he's concerned about is gamesmanship in Congress going to block a rightful president's ability to nominate. And he doesn't want this country to go into chaos, just as Justice Roberts has said, respect the institution. And in your prior conversation, which we heard in that little reel, was that he said there was never a bad thing said about another justice. And he knows that his legacy should not be a contentious nomination process. So I think in light of his own legacy, that's why he made the decision. All right. Now, we, I think he came in with about 80% approval rating. Good luck getting that anytime now, right? Let's take a quick look at some possible appointees by President Biden. We have Katani Brown Jackson. She's 51 years old. She's a Harvard College and Harvard Law School federal judge uh, since 2013, was nominated by President Barack Obama to be a district court judge. Biden elevated her to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District Court of Columbia Circuit early in her career. She was a law clerk for Breyer, so she would make an interesting choice. Leandra Kruger is another possibility. She's a graduate of Harvard and Yale's Law School, California Supreme Court Justice since 2015, a Supreme Court clerk, and has argued a dozen cases before the justices as a lawyer for the federal government and clerked for Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. Finally, let's look at one more, and that's J. Michelle Childs. She's a graduate of the University of Florida and University of South Carolina, a federal judge in South Carolina since 2010. Biden nominated her in 2021 for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of, of Columbia Circuit, also served as a South Carolina state trial judge. So those are just some of the names thrown out there. Andrew, any thoughts about any of them or any possible replacements for Stephen Breyer? So I think the thought is who gets through. We have to go with that. And unfortunately, it's not qualification. It's who gets through. And we look back. Why? Why are we saying this? Because if we look back, the Republicans changed the rules. And yes, we only need a simple majority to get through. But the Democrats only have 50 votes. And then they need to have the vice president vote to get that simple majority. So we have cinema. That's a problem. We have mansion. That's a problem. They all need to vote together. And James Clyburn said something today, endorsing Childs and saying maybe Childs could get some votes from Republicans. And I think it's more important sometimes who's going to get through back to that legacy conversation of having the legitimacy of the court than who's more qualified. Honestly, they're all qualified. We're talking about circuit judges, Supreme Court justices. These people are legends in their own right. So it's more about the processes than their credentials. Absolutely. As you see, politics continuing.
continuing to interfere with the work of that Supreme Court. And definitely problematic. All right, Andrew, stand by. We're going to take a quick break. But we've got a lot more to discuss because coming up next, the U.S. Supreme Court will take up a lawsuit that could end affirmative action in college admissions. We have details on that coming up next right here on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. The U.S. Supreme Court will take up a pair of lawsuits that could end affirmative action. In other words, the use of race as a factor in college admissions. Now, the lawsuits claim that Harvard University and the University of North Carolina discriminate against Asian American applicants. The case will probably be argued in the fall and was filed by Students for Fair Admissions. Now, that is a Virginia-based group that has worked for years to rid college admissions of racial considerations. The Supreme Court has weighed in on college admissions several times over more than four decades, most recently finding race could be used to tip the scales in favor of a minority student in the case of equally qualified applicants, much as legacy or musical or athletic talent is used in that purpose. Now, the current dispute harkens back to the first big affirmative action case in 1978, when Justice Lewis Powell laid out the rationale for taking account of race, even though court barred the use of racial quotas in admissions. All right, still with me, constitutional lawyer Andrew Lieb and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Gregory Walker. I'm bringing you back in as well on this discussion. But, Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Um, the culture wars, wars continue uh, with this court. You know, that's what folks have called it. Uh, uh, they've attacked religious rights. They've gone on to discuss abortion. They take these cases because they have something they want to do or say. This is a conservative court. They've taken these cases. Want to get your thoughts on whether affirmative action has any future in this country. Well, I first want to clarify this affirmative action conversation, because I think we're missing what Justice Powell said in the Bakke case, which you referenced from 1978, which is the key to this whole conversation. Justice Powell expressly said that you cannot use race to remedy societal discrimination. And that's what you and I and common people think about when we're talking about affirmative action. What instead he said is the compelling governmental interest, the compelling interest in this case was that diverse student body creates a robust exchange of ideas like you and I are having right now. So the interest is that. Now to your specific question, in 2016, Fisher was a 4-3 liberal conservative decision. We lost one of the liberal justices and gained three conservative justices. So simply on math and the fact that the Powell was analyzing the Harvard basis for admissions, which is now before the court again, signals that they plan on reversing this. So now you've mentioned how the court looks at this. So how does this court get to overturn that decision and say that race cannot be used at all because obviously that four to three majority found some way to justify with the constitution and whatever's in there the right to use that as a way of finding a diverse student body which was a compelling interest for the state or for the federal government so how do they go about reversing that if that's what they're going to do they actually gave the roadmap in backy in backy justice powell said one of the constraints, it wasn't just that you can't have a quota. You can't have a quota. It has to be race plus, as you were indicating, kind of like location or finances or religion or another thing like sex or legacy. But he also said it had to be limited in time. And in the case, he predicted in 25 years from 1978, hopefully we won't need this anymore. I will point out that Grutter, which was 25 years later, reaffirmed it. And then again, Fisher, some years later, reaffirmed it. But the main way avenue for them to get around this is to say it's been long enough, and now the compelling government interest from the federal government, the state government, as you indicated under Title VI funding, under Title VI funding, is no longer necessary because, you know what, we have enough of a diverse student body. I don't know if that's true, but that's a compelling argument. Yeah, no question about it. Now, Gregory Walker, I want to bring you in on the conversation. Have we reached a point where affirmative action is no longer needed? Are we, are we past that point now, just from a general discussion point of view? Mike, I feel like I'm back in constitutional law, back in law school right now. <laughs> it sounds like a, a, a law school question. Uh, but to answer your question, 
No, I don't believe we're beyond that. Um, the admissions wants to see their student body reflect what they see in society. There is no one size fits all. The student, the uh, admissions board wants to see students who have diverse backgrounds, whether it be color, like you said, whether it's um, athletics, whether it's music, they want their student body to be a reflection of what is out in society. I do not think that we are past it. You know, and that, that's a great point because, Andrew, you know, you talk about this, this, this interest in, in this diversity. You know, people, as you said, they, they misconstrue affirmative action to think that you're just giving these folks a leg up because of historical issues. That may have been the point in, at one point. But now it's really about ensuring some form of diversity on campus, which is a part of our education as people. It's super important. So how does the court skirt the idea that that is an important and compelling interest for this country? Well, let's start off with the differentiation. President Johnson is actually responsible for advancing affirmative action to remedy past wrongs. And again, Justice Powell dismissed that. He said that's not a possible basis. But to your specific question, we don't just see this in Title VI when it comes to federal funding, like for education, the way Harvard's getting funded, or a 14th Amendment with equal rights as we're dealing with the UNC case. We also see this in your job, in my job. If you've heard of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, when it comes to Title VII in the workplace, the hottest topic today, if you put on conservative media, media is reverse discrimination. They talk about critical race theory and they talk about different aspects that we need to fight back. But the real question goes back to what you said. And I think uh, you got you both gentlemen said it so perfectly. Look around the room. Is it a reflection of society? If not, don't we need to create a reflection of society? Because you and I right now are having a more robust conversation because we have different backgrounds and different things we bring to the table. That gets better thought. No question. Okay, finally, quickly, only in the last few seconds here. Andrew, what do you think the court does here? They're going to overturn it. It's going to go away. And the reason we know it is threefold. Number one, the Harvard case, they gave a chance to have the government respond and delayed. The UNC case, they gave certiorari from the district court without it actually going to the appellate court. And most importantly, as I've said before, it's now 6-3 conservative. So why would they take up these case otherwise? And I think this is going to have implications that people are not thinking about in employment discrimination and housing discrimination as well, where we're no longer going to be able to do anything because reverse discrimination is going to be coming up as suits everywhere. Oh, yeah, you know, and, and, and as you said before, the court sends messages by how they take cases and the cases that they take. All right, this is one certainly to watch. All right, Andrew Lieb, always a pleasure to have you on the show. We got you on speed dial. Anytime we need you on a constitutional issue, we're going to bring you in. Thanks so much for being with us. Gregory Walker, you're going to stand by when we come back. Back to court for part of the doomsday.